I am the grumpy one on this panel. So that, I just got to get that out there. I've had a very, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a grumpy person anyway, but this week, particularly, I've been hanging out. Um, I happen to be United Methodist, and uh, I've been hanging out with United Methodists who are putting queer clergy and queer bishop on trial for being gay in uh, the desire to uh, purge them. So uh, some of us have been spending time uh, demonstrating and protesting, and uh, including today, and listening to those arguments. Uh, so um, I'm even grumpier than ever. Um, the, um, I, I love the disruptive ethics theme. That really works for me. Um, I, I am the author of a book called Disruptive Christian Ethics, so that's partly why I really love it. Um, and, uh, but I have to say that uh, love is not a concept that attracts me, uh, especially not right now in this historical political moment. Uh, I like the revolutionary part of this, but I don't like the love part. I'm, I'm not into love. I'm against love, okay? And I'm, and I'm at this conference. I told you I was the grumpy one. At best, I find love to be a hollow word that gets repeated over and over by religious folks. Uh, it gets declared. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I have been in the context of a church meeting or a religious gathering or spiritual gathering and someone has said, can't you feel the love? <laughs> and in fact, what I have felt <laughs> is the institutional deceit and hypocrisy. And I have just felt so much like this declaration of the love and participation in it. Uh, this declaration of the love has been, in fact, the most toxic experiences, especially institutionally. It's like those folks who went to church on Sunday and then on Monday said it was fine to poison the water of the people of Flint, you know, and I'm sure they prayed about love and they sang some songs. They probably even held some hands together. Um, and, and that's the best thing I can say about love. I would say the worst thing <laughs> I would argue is that love most often is a weapon for it's weaponized, it's used to harm and abuse. And those of us who do work on intimate violence know this well. It is the stalker who says, I love you. It's the heterosexual father who rapes his daughter who says, I love her. It is the spouse intimate partner who has that stu suffocating control and that demeaning critique, you're ugly, you didn't get the food on time, you didn't take care of the kids, but it's because I love you so much that I have to tell you. It's the parent who slaps the child in the face, who says, you ain't nothing, you ain't gonna be nothing, who says, I just don't have time to deal with you, but I love you, I love you. So that's my first thing that I want to say is that we must disrupt the assumption that the assertion of love is something that does not need to be disrupted. Are you with me? We must disrupt the understanding that the assertion of I love you, feel the love, that that is something that does not need to be disrupted because it does indeed. My second piece I wanna think about is our collective moral compass. 
and the ways in which our collective moral compass can get so skewed, can get so narrowed. You know, it's already before the Trump, all the Trump stuff, right? Already beforehand, it was hard for some of us to understand and to feel and to grieve the mass shooting of those queer bound brown bodies in the Pulse nightclub in the same way in which we grieved the mass shooting in Mother Bethel. I know I'm making you uncomfortable here, but there was a way in which we could grieve that sacred space that got entered of Mother Bethel and see those praying people, black bodies praying people slaughtered. And the grievability, you know this, uh, this uh, feminist uh, philosopher, Judith Butler, who talks about the grievability and the ways in which certain people are endowed? That's how we can sort of define the dignity that we are able to, 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 to recognize in the other is the way in which we see their life as worth being grieved. Right? So just the, the Holocaust going on right now in Syria. Right? Our, our inability to have grief and to really grieve every single one of those lives. So already our moral compass, you see, is, has to be part of how we're understanding or at least the prerequisite for this work of love. But then with the election of Trump and now in this moment of 2017, I want to argue that our moral compass has been dramatically skewed, has been dramatically impaired. Our ability to recognize the worth of our neighbor has been impaired, the moral worth in the US by the fact that only a white man, only a white man who bragged on tape about how much he enjoyed suddenly and unexpectedly grabbing the vaginas of women that is sexually assaulting women, that is being a perpetrator of sexual assault, could then a few months later go on to be elected president of the United States. The normalization of not, not merely impunity, but rewarding a white man perpetrator of sexual assault, or at the very least, one who enjoys lying and talking about how much he enjoys sexually assaulting women on tape, rewarding this white man with the presidency has disciplined you in the mendacity of whiteness as innately superior. It's shifted your moral compass. It's dulled your moral capacity such that just even basic civility you're congratulating yourself on. And let alone the ways in which you're delighting in, and this is my third and last one, the delight in how much we love our neighbor as ourselves. I think loving your neighbor as yourself should be a minimal. I mean, just a barely minimal, barely good enough baseline for what it means to be loving to your neighbor. It's so inwardly directed. It's so inwardly directed and focused on, on how you, loving your neighbor as you would yourself, it doesn't allow you to recognize that what your neighbor may need what your neighbor may want may be wholly incomprehensible to you. Yes. 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 Unless you listen to your neighbor. 
your ability to see the ways in which the state is terrorizing brown immigrants may be wholly invisible to you. I just, you know, I just remember, can you still hear me? I'm sorry, my, um, just having technical problems here. Okay, there, you still got me? Okay, good. Uh, at the uh, Women's March, in D.C., um, it was one of those experiences, of course, if many of you were there, that you couldn't move, right? Um, but then there were these few moments where I saw these brown Muslim women in, uh, in hijabs. And, it was, and at the march, people were just across all kinds of groups saying, hi, and how you doing? And boy, standing here, you know, for 45 minutes to get to a porta potty is not, you know, it's fun. We could even sing, <laughs> right? Um, but I noticed, I noticed at the Women's March, these women, they, they parted. And no one, even, no one said hello. No one even nodded at them at the Women's March, right? So the ways in which we recognize who is our neighbor and who is not our neighbor. Loving our neighbor as ourselves and recognizing ourselves in our neighbor, that's, that's not a good starting point, um, I want to say. So finally, I've said all the things that love is not. Um, let me just quickly say just a couple of things love is. It is, one, it has to do, um, we have to have history. I'm a teacher, so I have to say we have to have history. History must be part. Who are the ancestors, the historical ancestors that enter your room, that help you with that moral compass that I'm talking about being skewed, who, who help you to understand what's revolutionary about the love? For me, it's, it's Septima Clark and it's Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells who enter the room, these anti-racist, uh, but their tactics and their strategies and their moral failures are part of what it is we hold on to to sustain us and for us to understand how to characterize the love that, uh, that we bring. And then the other piece I want to highlight is, is anger. Uh, as my um, former um, mentor, Beverly Harrison, wrote, anger is not the opposite of love. It is better understood as a feeling signal that all is not well in our relation to other persons or groups or to the world around us. Anger is a mode of connectedness to others, and it is always a vivid form of caring. It is a sign of some resistance to, in ourselves to the moral quality of the social relations in which we are immersed. Extreme and intense anger signals a deep reaction to the action upon us or toward others to whom we are related. So our love must include anger, not assaultive anger, not violent anger, but an anger that sustains us, that keeps us woke. Can I say that? I know sometimes when old folks use the, you go, oh, she's not really getting that, what that expression really means. But that's like, right, that gets it a little bit, kind of keeps us woke. Um, you know, when I was, uh, I, when I have, I worked in prison, uh, I taught in prison uh, as, as my colleague also, um, Terry Todd, we taught, we, at Drew, we teach in prisons, um, and I taught violence against women, and I'd never taught it in prison before, and it was really difficult, such pain the women uh, shared. But the first day, um, and the, this woman, I, I did my presentation, and this prisoner, inside student, we also bring our outside students, said, um, I said, let's process how this went. And she said, I can't believe, and she pointed her finger at me, that you are going to do this to us every week. The depth of pain as we talked about rape and violence and abuse 
that I was bringing up? And she said, and to what end? That's my question for you. To what end are you going to do this? And I remember what it took to hold that anger. (laughs) And I remember that that anger went throughout the class. I remember teaching about racism and the ways in which racism is a part of violence against women and violence against black women and the women prisoners, the white women prisoners saying, I don't want to hear about racism. Anything you describe that happened to the black women has happened to me too. I don't don't want to even deal with this reading. The work, you have to have anger You have to confront it, you have to hold it because it's the anger that brings about the disruption. The disruption in the white supremacist disciplining of your moral compass. What keeps you angry and opens you up to your neighbor who may or may not be like you as you do the work of love? Thank you.